Hi, what you're about to listen to is a conversation between the director and the producer of the music video titled Lost in Translation by Mr. Thinwheel. The link will be in the description below. Let's get right into it. Start us off with an introduction. Who are you, John? Uh, my name is John Hughes. I was the producer for the Lost in Translation music video for the band Mr. Thinwheel. And then I'm Ben Sharples. I was the director DP on Lost in Translation for Mr. Thinwheel. So uh, how, how, how did this project come about for us? I don't really remember when specifically I was approached to produce the music video. If we had discussed this at some point, I knew that um, Nathan was in the band, obviously, because we had done Session Zero before and I had met him then. But I didn't really know or I can't even recall when we started making the gears turn on that. But I knew it was a few months after um, Session Zero that we wound up doing it. But, you know, when I was told that a music video would be something that would potentially be coming to fruition, it kind of was exciting because I hadn't done anything like that before. I've done a lot of narrative and documentary based work before. Um, so a music video is kind of a hybrid in a weird sort of way in the way you attack and like kind of actually make the music video come to fruition because it's kind of has like lit and specific has a narrative to it if you dig deep enough and watch it over and over again there is some sort of overarching narrative to it but we shot it like a documentary almost in the sense that it was a lot more fluid and kind of just let things happen so yeah because i remember like coming out of school we did a we did a bunch of experimental projects. We did a lot of like short experimental visual pieces. And then I had like an epiphany where I was kind of getting into re- directing from shooting a lot, uh, DPing for people. And I was like, and then I randomly realized I was like, oh shit, I can just make a music video. <laughs> I like forgot. I forgot there's an, enti- right? there's an entire genre of like um, more <laughs> visual tailor made stuff, like people who are visual heavy. Like music videos are like a lot for those people, like any um, high end music video today. um, A lot of times it's like very visual directors and stuff because there's there's going to be very little dialogue in the music video. And then I think I was getting kind of into that. And then I think I mentioned it to the uh, the band. Well, I mean, Nathan and Nathan's kind of at the head of the band, my brother. And then we just kind of naturally was like, oh, we should make a music video because they they were coming out with their first like uh ep well, was kind of like an album for them but and th- and they're a instrumental like jazz fusion group so right there off the bat there's no lyrics so then we could take our narrative sensibilities and our experimental how we kind of like to make an experimental stuff and then we were like okay so what's this what's the best song off this upcoming ep that would work for the music video and then my brother was like Oh, it's lost in translation. And he explained like this huge metaphor for the song out of nowhere about a guy being like lost in repetition and then trying to like get out of that. And then there's all these like motifs throughout the piece, like the chain and the clock and stuff like that. So so then it was just like uh, it clicked for us. I think that's how I remember it. I think it was like I think it was August 2019 is when we got the idea. I think it might have been before that, because I do remember we met. The first day of shooting was September twenty first. If I remember oh, correctly. actually, yeah, it's way before that. Yeah, so yeah, we, yeah. I think we contrived the idea probably in the early summer at the latest. I think, but um, I want to echo your sentiment about you know the experimental sort of nature that was lost in translation because you know I kind of always kind of like the narrative film structure, and then I started to do more experimental non-fiction-y kind of stuff. Like I made Pandemic, which was a kind of narrative thing that was an experimental. There's a story there, but it's experimental in the way that it's put together. I think maybe that influence came from stuff that I had done way in the past that was sort of like that because there's just something about when someone watches something and goes what was that that's always been exciting to me um is just like well come up with what does this mean and 
know, because maybe I have my idea, but somebody else does. So I've always kind of liked the experimental sort of vibe that certain projects give off. And Lost in Translation, when I got the like script for it, because there was an actual script for it that Nathan wrote, which was kind of a um the script for it was pretty good for someone who had never written a script before, but it definitely did outline this is what I want, this is how I see it, and then we were able to piece those pieces together, for lack of better, and bring it everything, you know, just come make his idea a reality, I think, was something that we were easily able to do because of the script he came up with. And that's kind of how it became a hybrid of, let's make an experimental film, but it still does have a narrative even though there's no lyrics guiding it, I think is, I think that's um, just to echo your sentiment and put this all and, you know, put a bow on everything. I think the experimental aspects of lit were definitely some of my reasonings behind wanting to do the project. I mean, working with Ben Sharples is always fun. Session Zero was great, and then to do another project was another, you know, great opportunity, because I think working with people who kind of see things similar to me and want to do similar types of work, I think that that's always rewarding. Yeah, exactly. I think I'm also going to, I got to link uh, Session Zero in the description below, which is a D&D short film, but um, <laughs> I'd say uh, also working with the band was nice because I've basically friends with the band my entire life. So uh, they're all equally like-minded creative people. We've all watched the same movies, played the same games, read the same books. So we were already like from square one on the same page of liking the same things. And it was just a matter of bringing in you, John, and bringing in outside people to make the video happen that we had to, everybody, everybody kind of had to mesh. And um, it actually wasn't that difficult to, to bring people along in a sense because some of us were already out of school and then other people that helped us, um, like for example, uh, Emmanuel Gardner, Ben Bradford were still in school. And then, uh, we had Jake Deedon, who's, uh, another great DP. He came to help me out to AC and he was out of school. And then you currently were in school during this too. So it was like a matter of finding, uh, when to shoot this on, uh, uh, actually, I mean, you can talk about that if you want, but uh, how did we uh, how do we end up making this? Like, how many days did we do? Yeah. So I think that there were three days that were actually scheduled. Like, these are days that everybody needs to be here. And then there was an additional day or two with a skeleton crew. Um, so it basically was done in two weekends and maybe a couple of extra days for pickup. But one of the biggest challenges I think with music video, especially for me, was I had never worked on a music video before. Um, I have professional experience in narrative filmmaking, and I have done a lot of experimental work just out of passion project. But even though this project sort of had this narrative to it, making a music video is a lot harder than just shooting. All right, here's we're shooting four pages of dialogue today. Great, because it was a lot more run and gun. And uh, that was something I wasn't used to. So I had my hesitations from the get go. But I think once we get the crew together and we kind of said, hey, we're just going to run a gun. I think everybody kind of meshed well. And I think that that's an intrinsic part of making a film, especially on the student or independent level, be any good is by having people mesh. And a lot of times, just out of my own experience, and I'm sure through other people's experience as well. If you don't mesh on the first day, it's probably not going to be a problem because maybe you'll catch a stride and maybe everybody will, you know, get it together and they'll start to click. And I think towards the end, we started to click and everything was a little bit more, you know, here's how things are working. Here's who does what. And it was kind of overlapping roles like we're doing this, this and this because it was such a small skeleton crew for the most part. Um, but that's expected of student and independent work for the most part. But I think because we all clicked 
towards the end especially and everybody was able to you know fill some sort of role initially um and get into that focus and get into that rhythm i think the rhythm is an important part of making independent and student work especially because it'll translate so much higher uh and it'll be way better for you to have those abilities to work you know crazy hectic environment where there's only four or five people working on this film but at the same time you know you have don't know where i was going with that one but uh overarching point is once everybody on the crew clicks once everybody clicks i think the project will be so much better and it helps when you have chemistry with people because most of the people that we worked with i think short of most of the band um or all of the band for that matter everybody else went to college together so mm -hmm. we yeah. had that sort of chemistry and that i wouldn't say bond because it's probably not the right choice of words but i think because we were cut from the same cloth almost i think it was easy for us to share common terminology because i'm sure it's not uncommon that somebody will call something one thing and it will confuse use somebody on a crew at some point in their career um but i think that the the way we were able to just you know come together even though most of us i don't think i've worked with a majority of the crew uh, before and definitely hadn't ever worked with the band i think collaborating with the band was super fulfilling because i got to take new people's creative outlooks and combine it with this sort of you know i call it the like fitch bam school of thinking almost mm -hmm. where we sort of have this preconceived idea of how film works and how things should be done and certain other elements come into play because we are we all are from that same i guess origin of filmmaking and we've all done sort of the similar things before and we all kind of know you know the ins and outs of how we want to operate based off of this common vernacular and common sort of drive to make films i think some of the people that we went to school with are certainly some of the hardest working film people i've ever met oh yeah sorry uh i think i think we kind of like we went to school full of like different types of film people but for sure there was there was people in there that um oh by the way yeah we went to fitchburg state in massachusetts but um we there was a certain people that you could pick out that were kind of like cut from a different cloth. You could tell like they just like lived and breathed love film and they were just trying trying the, to get on set and shoot. Falcons. Yeah, exactly. And like they're sure there's a lot of people who were there just because they would go to college or they're just trying to find like find out if they like it or not. But for us, like we, we always try to just work with the best people and people who, that bring stuff to the table and shooting something like this where we're shooting gorilla. And we're on our feet all the time making stuff. I just, I really wanted to like bring people in who could come up with ideas and, you know, take it off, take off the load of people. Because when you're just the one person with the camera and you're just sparking people around, uh, you don't get as much good work out of it. And we saw that on our previous project on Session Zero. It was like, we realized how, how much like good shit came out from the piece, um, just from the actors and just from the crew members of just, coming up with ideas and you know improving things on the spot and so i don't know i think that was like from the start i knew that i knew that was like gonna be central like if we don't get a good crew we don't get people to mesh and we don't get the band and the uh the rest of everybody to work together as one then things might come out stilted or whatever because a lot of times with there's no budget projects or low budget projects is uh it all comes down to people and uh basically timing like when are you going to do things exactly and, and to echo budget too a lot of um you know we did buy a lot of things like the chains and the clock and there was a lot of research that went into that ahead of filming like what do we want and what and it was a lot of talking to nathan who was kind of in his own right sort of an artistic director for the project um originally i was going to do the production design and stuff because i have experience in that but we kind of said Nathan, it's your project. Would you like to, it's your sort of baby in a sense. 
I kind of treated it like client work, like, what do you want? And the best or the best way that I could potentially say, what do you want is to just let him do his thing and say, you know, I want this. I want the chain to look like this. I want to do this, this and this. I want the clock to look like this. So I think I had picked out at least half a dozen clocks between Ben and I, and we eventually settled on that one that winds up getting burned in the uh, final uh, sort of act of the whole piece. But um, there was a lot of, you know, we need the money to do these things. So we had to crowdfund the project. And there are certain struggles that most kids that are in film school or people starting off doing independent work, it's hard to get money to do things. And it's it's a very expensive hobby, filmmaking. I think that's what a lot of people often hear and often say, yeah, I agree. So we had to craft on the project. I don't remember what our goal was off the top of my head, but I know we definitely probably came in a little bit under, I think in terms of what we raised versus what we actually spent. I could be wrong. I think we ended up that. raising but half of what I don't have the exact wanted. figure off the top of my head. Yeah. All right. So maybe, maybe we didn't cut. Uh, I have a budget that uh, would tell me more of these things specifically. Um, but I don't remember what we finally uh, actually spent. So let me pause and look that up. So there's going to be incessant keyboard noise. Well, I know what it is, actually. Do you? Yeah, yeah. You know how much we, we spent? Yeah, yeah. It was only like the budget was extremely small when we, when we got going. It was around like $1,100. And then we literally yeah. just spent it. And, we, and all it was was it was fundraised from uh, Indiegogo, just from the band's community and their, their small following. And uh, just with that, I mean, I can get into uh, gear if you'd like. Yeah. So uh, before we do that, before we jump into that, uh, with the budget coming entirely from crowdfunding and other, you know, in kind sort of donations, um, we wound up spending thirteen hundred and sixty one dollars to make this music video. So well, there spent you. a little under two grand to make it come. There you go. I got, I got fruition. Got, got the number wrong. <laughs> But uh, mm -hmm. I I'd say yeah I remember the uh, yeah for gear it just ended up uh, going with the times and ended up trying to get smallest but best rig we could get because the um, the shoot was gonna be very mobile as you can see from the final product uh, so I ended up just going for a Black Magic Pocket 4K uh, renting it from someone uh, with like a Sigma. 18 and 35 zoom. It's like a neutral kind of modern lens. And then we use the uh, Z crane three, which is just like a Ronin um, uh, two handed stick gimbal uh, and then just tripod. And, but the, the main, I think the main breakthrough that we, that we kind of did on the project was, um was the lighting. <laughs> Agreed. Cause Certainly. We, cause uh, the lighting is, uh, there's not a lot of money. The only thing I ever rented for lighting was a HMI Joker. I think it was a uh, 200 watt. I'm not sure. I used that for the uh, final clock scene where he he's running up to the clock and he's viewing it. Actually, I think both clock scenes uh, just to get more light in there because we were we were um, ups the sun was obscured by all the brush that we were shooting in. But essentially, the entire film. I mean, I can get into production. I might as well. Um, most of the film was shot. Uh, traditionally like late afternoon or mid afternoon towards towards golden hour. I don't think we had any shoots that were before the afternoon. So it so may have been some early morning stuff, which were just pickups, but I don't remember what I think we, I mean, we had pretty early call times, but like we didn't get started shooting until probably the afternoon. Like they were 12, nine, 12, and then eight. But yeah, you know, we, I think we kind of, jumped right into it and said, you know, this is how much sunlight we have. This is where we want the sun. Let's shoot this way. Let's just make it happen. I think what happened is the, um, the, the black magic is a small sensor. So it's really easy to get almost everything in focus. So since it's adventure piece, there's like a lot of wides and a lot of him traveling and stuff. So I was cool. And the band was cool with the idea of, uh, most of the film being like this, like harsh late afternoon sun. And uh, it kind of like challenged a lot of my preconceptions before, because when before I made the the 
the video, I I thought like you could only film at like certain times of the day, and I was kind of falling for like that golden hour myth. But we shot plenty of plenty of scenes around three or four p.m. with just a like a harsh New England fall sun, well early fall, um, and a lot of it just it matched across the board across various locations. Um, but uh, actually, you know what? We should get into uh, locations. You want to talk about that? So there were at least seven locations that appear throughout uh, the entire duration of the music video. Uh, most of them are in southern Massachusetts or Rhode Island. And um, a lot of them, you know, I, I was on most of the scouts for the locations. But one of our main challenges, I think, especially for me coming not from that sort of, you know, let's run and gun and shoot sort of background because I like to prepare things, especially being, you know, the producer for fun. The run and gun shoot worried me because how do we, how, like, if the sun's not cooperating, then what do we do? What's the alternative plan? Like, what, what if the weather is bad? What if that, so there was a lot of what if behind actually getting certain things we wanted from certain locations unfortunately we had good weather for both weekends that we shot so i wasn't too you know i didn't have to come up with some sort of crazy backup plan on the spot but me being used to a sort of rigid schedule we're shooting these scenes today and we're shooting these amount of pages today it was very hard to balance locations so there were some days where we would shoot you know like we did all the power lines in one day thereabouts i think we might have kicked some over to the next day and done some of the wrecked car footage either that night or into the early evening the next day after doing the interior stuff in the bedroom um then we went to the abandoned warehouse the same day so we may have doubled back and went back to the woods it's kind of a blur honestly um but then i wasn't there for the second weekend because i had other commitments and such but uh, the backyard stuff was done in one day, and then Ben took a smaller, even smaller crew than we already had down to Rhode Island and filmed some stuff down there as well. So, yeah, the last day was uh, there was a lot of uh, scheduling issues, but it was I think it was just mm -hmm. literally me, Tyler, he's the, the uh, key actor, and then also the bassist in the band, and then Nathan, uh, you know, keyboardist and songwriter, my brother. I think it was just us three. So. Last day was last day was a lot of fun because it was like it was like old times when we all used to make videos together as kids. So last day was like it was, it was stress heavy, but we were kind of running around um, the coast of Rhode Island, getting getting all those pickups, and of course getting that final sequence where he's just at um, he's at Fort Weatherhill, which is uh, the same beach they shot uh, Moon Rest Kingdom at. Which uh, I mean, I'm I'm beyond tired of going to that beach because I've done a lot of work there but <laughs> but uh yeah I, I think across the board the locations we ended up getting a lot done and uh i was i was really happy with uh the power lines in particular i didn't think they were going to come out that strong i thought shots were beautiful yeah i thought we were going to go to the power lines a late afternoon and just get washed with sun and have a bunch of issues but for some reason it just ended up just like clicking we had like just the right position just when we started um Especially that, like him walking into the woods, and then him, uh, was it? He's like walking through, like it's like a kind of like a tree tunnel to get the chain. That would look pretty good. The uh, the silhouette one, yeah, just stuff like that. And then, uh, even uh, I mean, I'm watching right now the uh, him in the the bedroom with the chain and the TV. That was that was that was interesting because it basically just took my bedroom and just stripped it out and uh through the TV on through the chain and try to like make it go blue and soft and silhouette. So a, lo a lot of that ended up coming out like beyond what I, what I wanted. And it was really good. And then it, it matched, matched nicely with uh, other silhouettes later on in the piece. Cause uh, this was fun. Cause this was the first project where we get to like mess around with silhouettes and stuff. Um, But, Oh, and then there was the warehouse too, which was, <laughs> Definitely guerrilla filming, where we just kind of get in and get out because it's a abandoned it was, warehouse. Yeah, it was 
the the moral the moral of the story the largest takeaway for anybody who wants to make student film or <laughs> independent film yeah. is why buy what you can just steal which is like such a like it feels dirty to almost say that but well, also everything i don't think i was gonna say go is, um when you're shooting with a camera like the pocket and it's such a small rig um and you're you're all relatively still young like you're still young kids out of college filming a video so I, I look at it this way some people will never agree with me but it's like you're in a warehouse it's a couple kids you're filming a video if someone catches you you just get kicked out it's literally all that happens so it's like right it, it's that uh, to me personally i think it, you should preserve some of that like you shouldn't always like go on a professional set and get used to that that way of things like sometimes you just make a project on a win with a few guys and run out in the woods and shoot shit like you know just don't don't forget where you came from basically that's <laughs> i i think it's a blast like shooting stuff <laughs> shooting stuff on the fly getting in and out i remember my um my film professor back in the day was telling me about how he used to like sneak a camera on a subway and make short films and stuff so it's it's definitely a part of filmmaking that a lot of people don't talk about and I'd be surprised to find out how many uh, locations and sh- music videos today probably don't have permits. It's kind of like this like untalkable taboo thing that people don't talk about sometimes. We we definitely totally pulled permits for every location that we went to. <laughs> we, we totally did that. We filed with both the state of Massachusetts and Rhode Island and said we'll be filming here. I don't know why I would waste my time doing that. I know why I would waste my time oh, doing I think it's it also because – um my bad. I, I think it's also because – we went to a school basically in the woods. So we were used to just shooting stuff fast, you know? Yeah. I mean, it, I think that for people who want to make film and are student or independent level, for sure, just go out and do it. The worst thing that's going to happen is you get kicked out. And I'm not advocating that you should go and trespass and make films by any means. I'm saying that if you're willing to take that risk, why, why not just go do it? Do it live. The worst thing someone says is get out of here or you get arrested. But I guess, you know, you kind of pick your battles like we did everything in this film. Everything in this film was entirely trespass and we didn't get arrested and we were fine. That's not to say you should go do dangerous things. And well, we also, um, you know, we also lived up to like the short film tenant that people always say, which is like use what you have like that's what we did in in the strongest sense like probably two-thirds of the film is filmed in the same like two town span right just south definitely south coast mass like you know like like the clock scene i filmed in uh we we filmed in our my uncle's backyard i mean people won't ever know that but he's just got a lot of large plot of land he's got a lot of grass so i just kind of placed it there and kind of made what we could with it because we we had That's, to we had to burn the clock so i mean we could talk about that briefly if you wanted but that right. that, that was but, <laughs> that was a, a challenge right i did definitely want to just jump back to um just put a bow on the you know trespass and just have what you have kind of deal it's i think it's more fulfilling when you don't have to spend crazy amount of money if you write a script or come up with a project that requires a lot of you know, moving parts that are going to be very costly because if you take that money and dump it in a good camera and good G and E stuff, great, whatever you can rent all that stuff. Great. But if you want to go out there and you have subpar gear and you, you know, just want to do your thing, do your thing. That's pretty much it, but do it at locations that you have access to and do things within your comfort level enough that you're able to push beyond that a little bit. Mm -hmm. And certainly use what you have that's the best resource you have like a lot of college kids have cars so you see a lot of people shoot things in cars or have things that you know revolve around there being a car or a lot of people make films that are you know in colleges or around surrounding college students because the network of at least where we went to school theater and film were in the same department so a lot of kids knew other people in other aspects of communications so 
it was very easy to find college kids who wanted to act in movies because it was almost expected that in addition to doing actual theater, you were also expected to sort of, and some people didn't, but it was expected that you also do some film work as well. And some people definitely did more than others and some did more films and some did more theater showcases and stuff. But definitely if you have access to people who want to work and people who are willing to help help out on your projects and return favors later, then you kind of take your network and write based off of like, there've been times where I've written characters and I said, I know who's going to play that. And I've thought about who would I cast in this role specifically? Like I just read a script that somebody sent me and I was like, I can see this person. So I told the director, like you might want to reach out to this person. So Mm -hmm. write with what you know. And like, if you know that you are going to need like a car from the seventies in your script, maybe you have the money to do that. Or maybe you are confident in your ability to crowdfund and get that money. But if you don't have it now, it's going to be a lot harder to get it later. So I think to echo your sentiment earlier, Ben, I, you should definitely use what you have and use what you have access to. That's definitely the best way to save money on making films. And it'll just save you the headache if you can just say, hey, my parents have a pool and we need a pool. You know, we'll be super safe about it. Nobody's going to get hurt whatever. Yeah, I actually have something to Sorry, you're we'll cut, take you're the cutting precautions, out, but cutting we just need bit. characters sitting by a pool, pool, something like. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Um, I remember I was sitting in school, and uh, Kevin McCarthy's a good professor. He he showed a film where the film opens, and this this guy walks into a house, and then he's just like, "Come on over here." He's like talking to some like his dog or whatever, and then he goes around a corner, and I think he's getting evicted or something, and then it's an alligator. The guy has a pet alligator. And then, and then he, my professor pauses the video and he's like, you see, you see why this video is compelling? Cause everyone was like, what? This guy's a pet alligator. He's getting evicted. It was like a short film. And, uh, essentially the, the guy who made the film knew a guy who had a pet alligator and he wanted to make a short film about that. <laughs> and it was like a, it was like a Vimeo staff pick, I think. So <laughs> I don't know. It's kind of a dumb analogy, but it's, it, it's like whatever works, I guess. Like, for example, it's uh, true. if you know a guy who has an alligator. <laughs> do it, I guess. Yeah, just send it like it's kind of my mantra. And I think I think Lost in Translation really helped me push the envelope. And he took me out of my comfort zone because I was not used to shooting like guerrilla style because Ben kind of took charge as the director. He's like, you know, I want to shoot this scene now and I want to do this a little bit later. Um I'm thinking about this shot and would be like, cool. I I think when you can kind of trust your director's judgment as a producer, it's very relieving because, you know, I think Ben and I sort of work in a simpatico nature where, you know, not that we're like completing each other's sentences, but Ben will suggest something and I'll trust his judgment. And I think there were more, especially in the post-production end of things where he was dealing with the band because he obviously his brother is in the band and dealing with the post end of things specifically to preserve his vision i i definitely said ben you don't have to ask me things just i trust like you i trust your judgment for the most part is you don't need to ask for certain things because i know that you know what you're doing and it's not like other projects in the past or horror stories that i've heard about projects in the past that friends have worked on where certain people kind of are leery about you know maybe the director's vision is a hundred percent or maybe there's toxicity on the crew that people are overstepping boundaries or something to that effect so it's very relieving to work with a crew that and a director especially who has a vision and says i want to do this and i want to do it right now and I'm, we're going to do this other thing later and we're going to it's all going to come together but there were times where i was like trying to like almost edit the film in my head seeing what but like I think Shane did a way better job editing it than I could have ever done it in my head. Yeah, I so, feel I feel the same way. Not to jump into the post yeah. end, but I I think the trust has to be there for the crew to really come together and make something good. And I 
think once we got on set and once we got rolling with the gorilla sort of style, I, w- I was still trying to think like a script super almost like, all right, where is this going to go? And then once I shut my brain off and said, does it matter? I was like, there's no real narrative structure that could be shown with this piece taken out or with, you know, that there's something about this that regardless of what we get in the end, there's this narrative structure to it that I guess is sort of all encompassed in just like the sum of the whole is greater than the parts almost because I was trying to figure out where's that going to go? Where's that going to go? How does this fit in the narrative? And I think once all that comes together in production and post-production, you kind of look at it and go, all right, I see, I see the vision now. So it's, it's good to have a director who kind of can say, we're going to shoot this gorilla and still come out on top because there were times where on set, I was like, my head was spinning because I'm like, where, what, what part of the script are we in? And eventually I realized it just didn't matter. Yeah. Cause everyone had it in the back of their head. It's a lot of times it's like that. I mean, like you said, it's like, it's, it's that symbiotic relationship where I, I think that's the main problem people have is they don't, they're not like friends before collaborators. You know what I mean? So pe- like, you. like you have to be like, you have to already understand the person that you're working with, like be buddies with them and know what they like and know what the other person needs from you. And it's just, it all becomes like in the back of your head and then you don't have, um, cause the main problem, uh, in my opinion, the directors and producers have conflicts is they just don't, they don't know all the answers or they're confused or the producer doesn't have all the information he needs or the director feels like he's getting pulled down from the vision or whatever. So, and it was like that as well with uh, Nate, because Nate was kind of like this like secret director writer in the background with the vision. And he would just say things he wanted, but he's not a filmmaker. So he would just verbalize it as like, oh, I want um, what do you, you want to say? Like, he's like, oh, I want Tyler to walk through the river. And I was like, all right, what, what the river in the back of the power line part? And he's like, yeah, Ty's just going to walk to the river. And I'm like, all right, well, fuck it. <laughs> and then Same. I was like, and then I was like, all right, so we can just shoot it from this angle and like, we'll just go with it because we have Tyler acting who's part of the band who's he's down for anything. Um, and that was nice to have like, Tyler because it wasn't like we had an act actor that we had to like take special care of, which can bother me sometimes where they get. I don't know, like, like I mean, I can get into this, but basically t- the the inspiration for the music video, the early inspiration for me, which gave me the idea of how I wanted to do it visually and how I wanted to carry it out, was uh, a lot of like Radiohead music videos where Tom York is the main character, who's the singer of the band. And in a lot of those music videos, he's doing all types of wild um, stuff in those music videos. Like the the recent one on uh, was like Anima on Netflix was, was amazing. It came out like right when we were coming up with the ideas. Um, but bringing on Tyler because we didn't have any actors that we knew that were available that were down to do like the no budget project. Um, having Tyler a, a part of it was awesome because Tyler, Tyler's even more courageous than me. He'll just jump in a river, climb, climb the big mound or whatever. And he's just down for, it. I mean, he literally climbed into a, that, that car in the video is that's an actual destroyed car in the woods. That's not fake. So <laughs> Tyler is just like, I'll hop in it for the video. So that was that was fun. So essentially what I'm trying to say is um, like if you're going to work with someone and collaborate with someone, you should be able to like get coffee and hang out with them and watch a movie with them before you work with them. I think everyone just jumps to the chase where they're like, oh, we got a project. Who's the producer, the director? And they don't really know each other yet. And it's this problems just start to occur because, as you know, when you're on set and you're 10, 15 hours in or whatever, people's real cell. the real part of themselves starts to come out. So it's like, yeah, it's, it's going back to what you said, which is trust is probably the most important thing that you learn about filmmaking. Two for the band. It was kind of like, I'm sure that they had some sort of, all right, we need to trust their judgment on how we go about doing this as well. And I think, you know, we also had to say, well, we got to trust their judgment. This is kind of what they want, almost in the sense that this is because there was a whole, you know, the whole him crossing that stream or whatever thing. It was just, I remember being on set and being like, OK, because sure, 
you know, I, I kind of just wanted to preserve the vision and said, sure, let's do it. If everyone's okay with it, let's go with it. You know? Mm-hmm. So and that car was a great find. I think that was definitely one of the yeah, most it's... interesting things and interesting locations that we came across. Though my favorite, I think, is just how crazy that warehouse is and just how much graffiti there was and just going into the different rooms of that place and seeing all kinds of whatever all over the place it was just super fun to look at. And it wouldn't be a Fitchburg film if someone didn't make a film about nature and graffiti. Um, so I think we, you know, you know, been there, done that, got that T-shirt, if you will, mm-hmm. um, kind of checked off that box. But. Yeah, exactly. I, I think it's. um. What was I gonna say? Lost my train of thought. Oh, oh, that's what I was gonna say. The like the the car, the um, the warehouse. Those are things that m- me and the guys found as kids, just naturally. Like the car a week before or two weeks before shooting, Nathan just found mountain biking through that area. So it's going back to what we were saying. It's a lot of these like natural things that you can find that are really interesting. Like I think we picked. I think a, a, among all the locations. Uh, each place we picked kind of had like unique natural characteristics to them. Like the beaches is kind of like this like really serene place in Rhode Island. The power lines are, especially if you're walking under power lines, it's, it's always a strong, a strong thing to a scene. Like it goes back to like the uh, scene in seven when they're under the power lines. I mean, I don't know. I, I think it's like finding those natural. I mean, a lot of my, inspirations are like you know the typical like terrence malick tarkovsky alejandro and arutu type of films where it's just they're bringing like this like natural wonder to things where you you find these places that are just hidden in time basically they're always the same um like that's why a something as simple as a sunset or a mountaintop summit shot never really gets old for people is it's just that it's just that natural wonder it's that feeling of adventure that that's i think that's what we were really looking for and we got it so i do wish we could have got on top of a mountain though <laughs> something like that and you know and then like uh <laughs> just embracing mobility for shooting i think is key like especially for a music video like a lot of times people we can get lost in the uh the setup so we can get lost in working in a studio space and getting everything dialed in so far much and having hundreds of quasar lights behind us and elaborate set. But I don't know, in my opinion, no, nothing beats getting out there on location, honestly. So, but, uh, I will, I'll, I'll end it at this. Um, I'll give you a question. Uh, what was like the, what was something on the, on the project that you wish you could like take back, like fix? Uh, just wondering. I think uh, the, to go back and I think I would have been I would have wanted to have been there more because I feel like it's always better to just be there, but I couldn't because I had other things going on, unfortunately. But um, I, I feel like being there more and just being able to see more of it come to fruition and maybe suggest things and say, all right, what if we do this? Because a lot of at one point during the we were shooting something, maybe it was like one of those like flora tunnel sort of shots where Ben went off with the people that he needed to go off with. And me and Nate were kind of setting up for the next scene, which I think might have actually been the scene where uh, Tyler is sitting by the fire with his pants drying. And. Yeah, I think I don't remember if it was me or Nate, but we kind of kind of spitballed off each other of like, how should this look? And I think eventually one of us just kind of grabbed a stick and then said, you know, he had brought an extra pair of jeans. So we kind of dirtied him up and then threw him on the stick. So I think having been there more, I would have been able to say, well, what if we do this or what if we do that? Because the just gorilla sort of let's go out and just do it live sort of nature to it fuck it we'll do it live everybody kind of <laughs> yeah the fuck it we'll do it live <laughs> that sort of mantra of just kind of sending it and just say we'll get something and then we'll just put it together and post the 
classic we'll fix it in post was kind of on the back burner a little bit like yeah it'll come together they'll, i don't know it's that, it, that, that's for better or worse whatever the clips are that's honestly different that's like if we shot a wide and there was a bunch of shit in the frame and we're like ah, we'll fix it in post. <laughs> right that's true just make it a yeah. make it yeah, yeah but i i do but see that I that mentality kinda, yeah i think it, i do see how it could be scary but, for people Definitely. Yeah. But I think we were, as a crew collectively, there was a lot of let's sit down or we would just kind of spitball and say, well, what if we do this or whatever? And everybody kind of had an opinion, which to an extent was a bad thing, but to an extent also a good thing because it was sort of a way to suggest things. And then we put a spin on it that was things with no rhyme or reason. Sure. I think we could have kept better order on set and better. You know, I, there were definitely minor hiccups that came from the crew coming together for the first time and subsequently just, I think, on a set that like that, now that I know how guerrilla filmmaking works, I can kind of put some of that institutional hierarchy of filmmaking back into play because we kind of were less yeah, yeah. fair about... Yeah, we were kind of like was kind of doing imp- what, and there imp- was a lot of overlap of like. Yeah. Oh, you're cutting out. I couldn't hear you. Basically, like, um, I, yeah, basically you brace chaos too much on shoots like these, and then since you're working with a lot of younger filmmakers or student filmmakers, you all learn the same things. You all have wore the same hats before, so sometimes mm-hmm. you you clash with ideas and people all are jumping to throwing ideas in the air at the same time and we forget the hierarchy of things i mean i mean personally i don't i never like being like the dickhead director like yelling down at people but sometimes you just got to be like all right we're doing this everybody shut up so yeah uh, there were definitely scenes where that happened but yeah so i think i think it's a little bit easier to be sort of not necessarily sympathetic, but to listen to people when you're friends with them. And it's not like just some random PA who's like, well, if I was shooting, no, scene, yeah, it's not like I that. would frame yeah. this. Like, like, get out of here, kid. Right. But I think once everybody sort of settled in a little bit, it kind of got better. But there was definitely room for, all right, how do we want to attack this? And that wasn't necessarily a bad thing at times. Sometimes it was. It was just kind of a 50 50 ball, I guess. If I was there more, I think, and if I could go back and fix anything, it would probably be keep things a little more in line, I think would be the one thing I would fix. No, that for me, the main thing I'd fix is the, uh, sadly, the final sequence where I just kind of like, um, it's, it hadn't happened to me a lot in a lot of shoots. I mean, it happened to me that one time where you just get completely gassed shooting. And then you mm-hmm. just don't get – you're just like – because it was – we shot the clock scene and then there was a day after where we went to the beach immediately. It was just me, Nate, and Ty. So it was the smallest crew of any of the days. And I just kind of got gassed and I was just like getting shots as fast as I could and I wasn't shooting enough. And I wasn't being as attentive as I was on the other days. So some of those shots may suffer for it. And I remember when we got to the edit, we kind of had to rush things along and get super crafty with using the best shots we could and get rid- getting rid of a lot of the crap because um, we were just kind of limited. And then, I don't know, it's just little things like that that always that always bite at you forever where you're like, you wish you could take one day back and fix what you could have shot or whatever. But um, I, think I, I think it's kind of like a curse, but it's a curse and a gift that I have that mentality where if we go out there and shoot stuff like on a whim, I always feel like we're going to get good stuff. But you, there is those days that come on shoots like this where you just get hit with like, oh, I don't know how to shoot this part or I don't know how to hit this location from the right angle and get it get it as good as other days. So sometimes you just get super, super lucky with things that happen. Like you get those happy accidents, which are the best. That's the stuff that I love about filmmaking. It's like one of my favorite things. But um yeah, it's just a little it's just a little edit moments. I mean, I don't have to get it like deep into them. It's. It's tiring for people. I, I, it's funny because us as filmmakers, we have like these little things that we that eat at us. But a lot of times if we point it out to other people, they wouldn't even know. Like, uh, for right. example, the band, like the, the album, this album, the song that 
that it's from, they were like telling me all the problems that that bothered them about their past album on certain songs. And I was like, oh, I never noticed that. They were like, oh, you don't hear this crap? Oh, it sounds terrible or something. <laughs> or stuff, uh, you know, like it's it's just that that endless struggle of you want perfection or you want this to be better. But um, I think I think all in all, just to wrap it up, this is like one of the pro- it's one of the few projects where we finished it. And uh, I, I could tell everyone was like definitely happy with it. Like everyone was stoked. And uh, I think every- it, I think it had something maybe to do with the fact that the band was releasing music and they were releasing what I'm assuming is their first music video as well, because um, I'm sure that was huge for them as they make the leap. And, uh, you know, let's keep doing this music thing. And here's well, we have a music video now. We're legit. Like, I'm sure there was some sort of those feelings as well from the band. So I think it was not only just hype for the filmmaker, because a lot of times when I make a film, it's like a sigh of relief, like, oh, my God, thank God it's over. That was a slog. I can't believe we did that. But with Lost in Translation, I really didn't feel that. I felt almost happy. And maybe it's because I trust your cinematography will make literally anything look good. But also there was a vision that came together and I was super thrilled about it. And I was super thrilled that I could be on the project and produce it and bring all the parts together, even though a lot of when Ben and I make content, a lot of the producing work does fall on him because he's super into the let's get this done right and let's let me reach out to these people and figure out stuff you still there a lot, yeah a lot, i lost you for a minute Dis- discord was being finicky but it's i'll reiterate that point so when ben and i make content a lot of the producing i usually handle a lot of the book work like making the schedule keeping track of the budget and a lot of times i oversee a lot of the prop stuff as well and Likewise for Lost in Translation, until I passed it over to Nate, who I wanted him to sort of have that, you know, vision and be able to say, yep, I like that. I want that. But when Ben and I kind of make content, a lot of the pre-production work does sort of fall on him because he's always reaching out to people who he wants on the crew, because if he's directing something, he wants to be able to work with the people and be like, yep, I want them. No, maybe not them, but well, if we... You know, there's always a rhyme or reason for choices Ben makes, and I definitely trust his judgment as a filmmaker. And certainly where I have shortcomings, he's able to, you know, fill that sort of void. And I think we definitely found that on Session Zero, where I took care of the producing work in like two weeks, and we had the film basically done in a month. Um, But with Lost in Translation, it was a lot more, you know, all right, we're going to schedule this thing up. We're going to have plenty of time. We're going to go through the budget and Ben kind of handled some of the crowdfunding stuff so they could have the money locally. And um, also reaching out to people saying, Hey, we're in pitching it because he knew more information about me and were about the project than I did. Um, so he knew more than I did, I guess was sort of super helpful in a sense, but definitely overall, Working with Ben and him and I have a lot of overlap in the producing and pre-production aspects of things, but that goes into the overarching trust of having, you know, if you trust your crew and everything sort of goes off without a hitch, everything is going to be fine in the end and you're going to make something you're proud of. Exactly. Yeah, that's, you couldn't put it any better. 